Hey everybody, I am Greg Soul, and this is the Why Am I podcast, where I talk to interesting people and try and trace a path to where they find themselves today. My guest this go around is Rocky Powell. This party god, and yes, I'm calling her that, is a talented improviser in New York City, but also she is the host of the exceptionally funny Wild Nights podcast, where she interviews comedians about some of their, you guessed it, uh, their wildest nights. Uh, join the rest of the Party God squad and enjoy this chat with Rocky. Hey, Rocky. Thank you for joining me on, or I should say Rocky Powell. Uh, thank you for joining <laughs> me on the Why Am I podcast. Greg, thank you so much for having me. I just have to say right off the bat, I've listened to a few episodes of your podcast and your voice. It's nice to put, I've seen like little pics of you, but it's nice to put a face, a voice to a face, face to a voice. You have a great voice for podcasting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. you I know she didn't say I had a good face for podcasting. So that's that definitely, <laughs> I see where you're going there. Wouldn't that be an insult though, to tell someone <laughs> you have a face for podcasting? Well, I have a video component though, right? And yeah, it, <laughs> everyone does, but but for the listening, I'm a I listen to my podcasts. I consume them in my ears, so I like to have a pleasant voice. Your your face is perfectly handsome too. <laughs> I was definitely fishing for compliments, so thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I am definitely an audio person too. I I, I mm -hmm. like to listen to stuff. I do, however, if people have a video component, I you know, and I'm like researching, I want to talk to them, mm -hmm. or if it's just somebody I listen to a lot, I will at least watch one. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know. It just because I don't know. I build up like this image of what the person looks like in my head, and then. First. Yeah, and then mm -hmm. I'll see. But sometimes that's weird for me. Um, so luckily, I saw your picture first, like when I found you on Twitter. So it kind uh -huh. of it kind of solidified that for me. Otherwise, yeah. it can be a little jarring. Like sometimes I'll build up this completely different image of what somebody looks like. I think that's pretty common. I've done that too. I I because I visually uh, don't like I said I don't always watch the podcast i'm on the go a lot of podcasts i listen to at two speed because i'm just trying to consume the content like a podcast uh pac-man yeah. and uh and i so i don't get to sit down but if i interact with another podcaster or something it is interesting to put the face to the voice yeah i usually do like 1.5 speed that's usually what mm. i'm at and this is not uh, anything for or against gender. It's just an observation that I made. Most female identifying podcasters, I will listen to theirs at 1.5 or 2. But uh, most male identifying podcasters, I can listen to their podcast at 3 speed. Really? Faster? Yeah, that's just uh, in my in my data. That is what I've discovered. Interesting. Mm -hmm. In your in your spreadsheet that you keep yes, track of. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I notice most podcasters speak um, very measured and metered, and uh, I've done some like educational stuff, like online education, and mm -hmm. they teach you to do that. But I don't on this. I like talk a little bit faster. Like it just I yeah, know, it's more fun to me. It's more enjoyable. Let's get my yeah. words out quick. All right, well, let's do the thing. So you and I are standing in line. Where are we in line? We are at the CBD shop, and we're standing in line to get some gummies. And I'm telling you who I am. Uh, I'm not necessarily hitting on you. We're just killing time. All right. Yeah. Uh, and I tell you that I'm a Uber driver and we talk about that for a minute. And now it's your turn to reciprocate. So Rocky Powell, who are you? Um, well, I am a woman in need of some CBD at the moment <laughs> to keep me at a nice, even keel. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm never not really at an even keel. I'm usually... Keeled, even keeled. Um, <laughs> Very keeled. Got it. Uh, so I'm, I'm Rocky. I'm at the CBD shop. I'm probably picking up a little bit of incense as well because I'm out. <laughs> um, maybe not arguing, but challenging the uh, store owner on the price because the particular CBD shop that we're at always advertises their incense for one price and charges me for another. <laughs> a running joke between me and the universe. Um, and yeah, I'm an improviser. I perform uh, with a theater called The Armory every, or not every Friday, but almost every Friday night. Um, and I've been an improviser since 2011 when I graduated. I graduated college in 2010, moved from Long Island to Brooklyn. And yeah, I started taking improv classes in 2011 and I kind of never looked back. So that's 
That's what you lead with. You feel like you're an improviser. I've never heard anybody, you know, describe themselves as an improviser. I've always heard people say, yeah, I do improv, but like to me, that's almost a layer deeper. Like I am an improviser. I like that. Yeah, for sure. I am for sure. I am. Yeah. I, um, when I first started out doing it, I took classes and then the, it, the improv scene when I was beginning was really starting to bubble and hit a stride where everybody who was everybody, everybody who wanted to be in comedy was in New York city, either doing improv at UCB or the pit, or there's another theater called the magnet. And, you know, you could go into the subgroups too, of the people who do improv in Chicago or the people who do improv in LA. But for me, my center is New York city. That's my home base. And I got so involved in the community. I was doing indie improv teams, which are teams that you form on your own. Mm. And then you book your own shows, much like an indie podcaster. You do all the legwork yourself with no help from anyone other than (laughs) venues to allow you to perform there. And audience members who are kind enough to come the bad improv in the beginning. And then I was placed on a house team uh, at the pit the People's Improv Theater in January of 2014. And I've been on house teams either there or at my current theater since. So for eight years. So a house team is like, there's a known established improv group and like you're part of it. Or is the house team because the pit is like an educational thing, right? Or no? Well, both. So the pit uh, t- teaches classes. They teach improv classes, sketch classes, writing classes. They have some stand-up classes. And I was in their improv program. But a house team essentially is you audition and you're placed with usually teams have eight members. You're placed with seven other people. That is your team for the allotted period of time. So you're always performing with those people and you always have a schedule time to perform. So audiences know when to come see your particular team. Do you guys... And then it- yeah. hang out a lot like to develop a rapport with each other and figure each other out or how does that work it's it's either lightning in a bottle <laughs> or it's uh or it's okay we'll see you every week or see you at rehearsal because you have to rehearse every week and do a show every week so you would definitely be six a week at uh, or you know it's a f- flop nobody really gets <laughs> along you can't get organized you can't find a rhythm on stage my trajectory was I was placed on one team that was exciting because it was my first team and Mm. you know I get my house team spot and then six months later the way the pit in particular did it is Monday nights were performed in the underground theater and then Wednesday nights were the main stage theater house team shows so the Monday night teams were looked at as kind of like JV baseball teams or minor league baseball. And then the Wednesday were the major leagues. So I spent six months on the Monday night teams and then I got moved up to Wednesdays and I did a year on a team called Devo, which the big deal about Devo were we were seven women with one man on the team. And so we were like, when we were put together, we were breaking the jet, the norms of improv that are mostly men on teams and only one or two women only to a year later, get placed on a team with six men <laughs> and one other woman. But that was okay because that was my absolute favorite team. When that team was put together, we were called hero complex. When that team was put together, I knew everyone on the team. Everyone on the team was friends in a, like some kind of crossover way, everyone was extremely talented. So I had to make sure, I think at one point or another, we all felt like we were the weakest link on the team. So we're always just trying to keep up with each other, but there were no weak links on this team. So we always constantly challenged each other and we really liked each other off stage. So we would hang out, we That's would cool. have sleepovers, we would drink together, we would party <laughs> together. And, you know, for the most part, I think, you know, Maybe a couple people here and there still hang out regularly, but we have a really strong friendship and bond from being on that team for so long that we can't really, can't really shake. So that's cool. Something that popped in my head is, and I, I've seen this before, like, obviously I've never done that kind of thing, but like when you're on a team with, with people that are just really talented, I don't know, man, it it feels like the experience is so elevated. Like it feels like they pull me up, you know, like Mm -hmm. even if a little bit of my imposter syndrome is kicking in, I don't know, something about just being surrounded by like really talented people just 
kind of elevates things. Is that kind of the case for you, you think? I think that is the case uh, for everything. I mean, I don't want to, you can't speak for the whole world. Some people <laughs> walk in a room and they feel like I belong immediately, but I experienced that same thing you were talking about, the imposter syndrome. When I was first placed on this team, how am I funny enough to be performing with this person and this person? But then you realize through the lens of someone else, yeah, you belong here. You are funny enough to be here. You can hold your own. And then you do a practice scene and it crushes in a rehearsal and you're still laughing at it off stage. and the bonds start to form and new bonds start to form and the trust builds. So the main thing with improv is you have to have trust with the teammates you're on stage with. You have to have complete comfortability. Mm. Uh, they At this theater, especially around the Me Too movement, there was a lot of, uh, they put an improv grading level, which was called A, B, C, and D. And it talked on the wall about everyone's comfort level. So you had to decide which comfort level you were. Are you comfortable with somebody kissing you on stage? Are you comfortable oh. with somebody touching you on stage in an area that you're not really supposed to be touched? Like, are, And we always were like, we're a D team. So anything that we did to each other on stage, everyone knew that, it would never be coming from a place of harm or like perversion or anything like that. We could, somebody could grab each other's boobs. We could grab <laughs> each other's butts. We could kiss. We had that comfort, which you kind of need in improv because you never, you don't know what's going to happen. So Kylie, at that time, uh, did you feel like a change in the temperature? Like did, was there like a major shift for you guys or was that just something that, you know, you just kind of. Took and stride. Uh, we just always were a D team. <laughs> D team sounds bad if you're hearing it out of context. That means like our comedy was uh, bad. But no, we just always were blue, which yeah, yeah, usually yeah. if someone is referring to blue, if anyone doesn't know in comedy, that means you go a little dirtier, mm -hmm. a little edgier. We were always a blue team and we always would party with each other off stage. So we had another level of comfort and trust. And you can't have that with everything. So. Yeah, I don't know if that really answers your question. Yeah, you, but you guys had that big D energy. We had big D energy, <laughs> and we were the eight o'clock. Like I feel like I feel like I'm t talking about my glory days right now. <laughs> I and it's funny you ask this too because I thought the other day. So I still perform improv, and I love my team that I'm with now. It's a newer team, um, and I love all of them, and we have a great time. But I always wonder. Did I pass the prime of being on like the? marquee team because that's what we were for a while i'm like did i pass that was that my moment in in my improv history will i always look at that as the peak or will there ever be another peak i don't know i don't know only time will tell but for now that's what i gauge as my my peak improv times interesting yeah so something something you said kind of made me curious again like always like i i have it's like a serial killer's level of notes here like i just scribble like let's do it's it like charlie charlie <laughs> kelly you know looking for uh pepe oh. silva or whatever over here um i love always <laughs> i do too have you listened to their new podcast i have i've listened to a few i've listened to probably the first six or seven episodes yeah, yeah. that's about where i'm at too i just found yeah, out it's very ago. good but um so at one point you were new and you were surrounded by people that had done it before did you have anybody that kind of acted as a mentor or were you just on your own? Um, you know, I would say it was less of mentorship and more because improv, you usually meet people at your skill level because you're in classes with uh -huh. them. You go through the motions of forming outside teams and hanging out and going to watch other shows and you have to book a coach to your team. Uh. So I've definitely had a few coaches that have given me really useful notes and everything. I don't know if you watch the TV show Insecure at all. Mm -hmm. um, well, she's not only an Insecure. She's in quite a bit of things. But there's a comedian named Natasha Rothwell. And uh, she is really badass. She's on, I think, every season of Insecure. And her character arc gets bigger and bigger as the show goes on but she's a super talented writer she was a writer on snl and she was my coach for a while and she would give us the most nuggets of wisdom so those hmm. would prob probably be my mentors my teachers and my coaches but as far as somebody taking me under their wing and being like oh rocky hang with us that happens more 
or it did in that improv scene where time would go on and then eventually, you know, You'd hang out at the bar after and you'd meet this person who was on a show. And then the next thing you know, they would come, they would be in an indie show you were on. So they would ask you to do their show. So it was kind of just putting in the 10,000 hours Mm. and meeting people. That's how you moved up at improv, getting good and meeting people. So like people networking. Yeah, a lot of networking. Interesting. Well, you said you're on a team now that's mostly new people. Do you see yourself kind of fulfilling that uh, coach role a little bit? When I say new people, let me let me clarify that. They're new, or not all of them at least, are not new improvisers. It's been a new season at the at the oh, theater I, I perform at now. Yeah, so um, one, one of my, my friends on the team, she and I were on a team together a couple years ago, and we were friends outside of improv. But everybody else is kind of a new friend, even though we're in the same community. I don't know them as well, and, and I'm new to performing with them. But... Only a couple people on my newer team, I think, said they've been doing it for like a year or two. So I and I don't take any kind of a younger version of Rocky might have been like, okay, I've been doing this for (laughs) this many years and this is how this is going down. Now, this version of me, I show up, I have a good attitude and I'm ready to do some good improv, but I'm not trying to be the ringleader or the guru. The guru. So what's the <laughs> what's the feeling you have when you walk in the door the first day for a new team? There's a little bit of apprehension still, a little bit of excitement or their nerves? I, I would say still excitement. We had our first practice and first show last Friday night and it's still excitement because like I said, I knew a couple of the, the people on the team, but um, I hadn't been to an improv practice in a while, mm. a long while, like two years. That's a minute. Because there is this uh, cockiness that comes with veteran improvisers where they develop an attitude of, I don't want to practice. I don't need to practice. I know how to do this. And it is a bad attitude to have. We should all be practicing. <laughs> and after I left practice, I was like, okay, I feel good. I feel warmed up. But beforehand I did not want to go and the second you're in there doing scenes you're like when's it my turn again I want to get in the next scene so it's it's no but no uh like oh guys this is how we do it I don't do any of that (laughs) whenever you're like sitting in the the wings and you're waiting for your turn to go do you ever see somebody get like a prompt or they're in a situation where like god damn it why am I not there it's like I have this perfect bit a couple times oh yeah oh yeah yeah (laughs) or if you wanted to like walk on or something um I will say there there have been a couple moments when I've been in practices and had coaches who I don't think have been doing improv as long as me, and they'll explain something, and I have to resist the urge to tell them they're wrong, so I have to frame it, I have to frame it like a like a thought I just had. I'll say something like, "Oh, you know." I always thought this was done this way. Is that how you think it's done? Because I don't want to step on anyone's toes, particularly someone we're paying to coach us. But sometimes I'm like, you're wrong about that. (laughs) And my coach brain will take over. But um, yeah, there's been hundreds of times where I wanted to get in on a scene and just you can't. And that is a a mark of a good show. Oh, is when everybody's just dying to get in there and do the thing dying to get in there and wanting to do more if you get off stage the lights go out and you're you're thinking of all these things oh i wanted to do this oh i wanted to do this that is the mark of a great improv show that's cool yeah inside baseball why do you think that is uh because it's it can be hard to be up there and trust you're not supposed to have an idea of where you want the scene to go you're supposed to organically build with scene partner of where the scene is going so to say that oh my god i wanted to initiate this or i wanted to walk on with this or or i wanted to end it here and bring it back here that just means you were so invested in the show that the you were firing on all cylinders and um you kind of you if you're left with wanting more then the audience is definitely left with wanting more that's cool that's cool it shows that you're like really invested really engaged correct yeah when you guys would you guys all get off stage and everybody's feeling like that. It's like, what do you do with all that energy? Well, go to the bar. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the old theater, the pit where I used to perform, used to only be the hour-long time slots, and it would be two teams, and you would get about twenty-two minute, twenty to twenty-two minutes for your set. 
then you would go backstage and then the theater had a built in bar. So that was really cool. And there would be an organic audience. You wouldn't really know who'd be in the audience. It wouldn't be a lot of other improvisers, believe it or not. It would be a lot of people coming to watch the show. This theater that I perform at now, I always describe it as a little bit more guerrilla theater mm. because we do four teams in an hour or not an hour. We do it four teams in about an hour, 15, hour, 20. And mostly everyone in the audience are improvisers in this particular community. Mm. So it feels very under ground we're all getting our like fight club improv energy <laughs> out and i am a true blue improv nerd to my core so for me i do i do like that kind of like uh, we're just doing improv for improv sake and then if we have audience members there that are watching that's awesome too but they're they're really getting a improv experience that's so so do you yeah do you like performing more like in that environment for other improvisers as opposed to, you know, just muggles, just random people? You know, uh, it, it's, it's a split decision for me because obviously performing for strangers who don't know anything about improv and then doing a great show afterwards is satisfying, but to make other improvisers laugh, especially your peers, that is extra satisfying satisfying because we have all sat through hours and hours and hours of bad improv <laughs> and a lot of the time you're going improv show I shouldn't say you I should say sometimes I go into an improv show being like okay wow me you know what I mean and not, oh, shit. not even in a negative Entertain way I, I'm in a <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm in a I'm supportive but it's hard to turn my improv brain off of okay like giving thinking of notes in my in my own brain or, or what would I tell them to do differently? How would I tell them to make this funnier? It's hard for me to turn that off. So, when, and, imp and I'm sure for most improvisers it is. So when you can really be entertained by other improvisers or entertain your peers, then like you said, where do we go put our energy? We go to the bar afterwards. Then everybody can talk about, oh, I loved what you did in this show. I loved, oh, I loved this move. And we can all kind of just talk about it. I remember hearing a comedian one time talking about, um, making other comedians laugh and how mm -hmm. hard that is. And they were talking about how, especially when it's like a friend group of comedians that they'll yeah. tell a joke at one level and then they'll have to bring it up a level and a level and a level. And then if like after a couple of years of that, if a regular person hears what they're saying, like, Oh my God, you know, they're just like aghast because you guys have to like start saying crazier and crazier stuff to make each other it, laugh. Is it, is it that kind of energy? Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, oh uh, a few years ago, almost five years ago, four and a half years ago, I went on a trip to Ireland and four of my friend, friend it was this time when this airline was booking the $225 flights from New York out of this airport called Stewart Airport out of New York to Ireland nonstop for $225. So everyone I knew was going overseas using this, uh, using this airport and using this particular uh, flight company, whatever airline is the right word, <laughs> not flight company. <laughs> the airplane people. Yeah. This yeah, the airplane people. Uh, so I had four of my friends, regular friends, not comedian friends, that I'm extremely close with. They were going to Ireland, and I was also going with six other comedian friends. So at the same time, my, my four friends were traveling, and I happened to be traveling with the seven comedians. Even though we were all on the same flight, that's kind of where my itinerary lied. Um, and yeah, by the end of like the... It was like the second and a half, third day staying with the comedians. We are all having so much fun and it's bit after bit after bit and everyone making each other laugh. But then it comes to a point where you're like, I can't be on anymore. <laughs> I can't be on. I just need and I kind of even though I loved them and there was no bad blood and we all ended up meeting up, I did have to go escape to my friends and just kind of get a recharge with my people oh, yeah. because I had so much fun with the comedy people, but, and they're all friends and I love them all, but it is exhausting to have to be on for that long. And I'm sure they all felt it too, where we all just kind of like, okay, we need a little five minute break from each other, you know? <laughs> yeah. You're all just running a marathon the whole time. It, was... it is. Yeah. Who can out funny who, yeah. who's coming up with the biggest bit. Yeah. I was thinking too, I bet like, 
if you're with your comedic friends and then you just have a regular friendship, they probably have almost no idea what you guys are talking about. I just assume you come up with constant inside jokes and it's just a joke built off a joke and then nobody else knows what's going on. Sort of. I mean, my friend group in particular is a lot of theater people. That's where I met most of my friends is through college and my theater background. And they are hilarious. I wouldn't be friends with them if they weren't, but they're hilarious. <laughs> they're so funny that sometimes when I'm with my core friend group, I just like sit back and I just take it in. And if I feel like I'm off the clock. I'm like, I don't have to make anyone laugh now. We're all just making each other laugh. And these guys are pulling double duty and they're killing me. So my like my friend group makes me laugh like no other. But yeah, it is kind of a, a weird juxtaposition when you have normies and comedians. <laughs> But my my normie friends happen to be comedians in their own way. Let's, yeah, I mean, everybody I consider a friend really is uh, inherently funny. But you, know, but I'm assuming that like the people that I see that are like milk toast, boring that I want anything to do with, they're probably I don't know. Maybe other people find them amusing, and those people all stick together. I would hope. I have had that exact same thought before. I've thought to myself, every friend group thinks they're the funniest friend group. They must. Why would they, you know, why would they hang out with each other if they didn't think that these people, and then you hang, sometimes you hang out with people who you don't normally hang out with. Like if you're going to a going away party or going to meet somebody at a bar in the before times. No, long, uh, long ago. Yeah. yeah, long, long ago. Uh, you go and you're like, oh man, I did not vibe with those people. But they're all cracking each other up. You know, so it's all wavelength. Yeah. Everybody, you just find the people that are on your wavelength and just ride the wave. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not a normal dude. So uh, most of, I'm from Texas. I live in Texas. Most mm -hmm. of my family are rednecks. And so when uh -huh. I'm around them, I'm just, how's it going? You know, that's about its extent of the small talk yeah. that I can engage. It's like, dude, it's like, we got nothing in common. You know, right. yeah, I mean, you can always do the thing and uh, talk to people about their favorite subject, which is themselves. But at yeah. some point, you know, you start nodding off in those conversations, but I'm assuming they're yeah. a, a riot to somebody. I just I'm not sure who that yeah. somebody is. <laughs> the people on their wavelength. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, you've kind of, yeah. you flirted with it a couple of times talking about like your theater background and when you graduated. So take me back, take me back to little, uh, well, I guess back then you were Raquel, right? Sort of. In high school, uh, my family always called me Rocky. But in high school, my friends called me Raquel. And even I have, I'm still friends with a few friends from high school and they'll call me Raquel. And even a few college friends will call me Raquel because my freshman year, that's what I went by. But there was another Raquel who was two grades older than me and people called her Rocky. So I never introduced myself as Rocky. And then one time um, somebody called called me Rocky, a friend of mine called me Rocky, and then I kind of liked it when he said it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can be Rocky here. That's kind of cool. And then I just started introducing myself as Rocky. Yeah, like I said, it's pretty baller. Dude, I, I, Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> like Rocky fits your personality so well. Thank yeah, you. I dig it, I dig it. But take me back even farther. It's like, have you always been like this performer? Like everybody needs to see, uh, see you. Everybody needs to hear what you have to say. Like what were you like growing up as a little kid? Um, my parents, when I was little, we had, we lived in an apartment till I was almost nine. And in the apartment, the whole, whole entire living room was coated in mirrors. Oh, interesting. So you, apparently yeah. you bought this from people that had sex parties, huh? Oh my God. I definitely don't think that. <laughs> oh, you my don't want to think are that? I, wild, I definitely don't want to think <laughs> that. My parents are, wild, were wild as they come. I'm telling you, like they used to have both of them platform shoes with goldfish no. in them. They are as wild as they come. <laughs> I would bet the farm that the two of them have never participated in a sex party. That is not the extent of their wild. They, I don't think they could ever uh, do do that. That's not a knock on them. It's not a knock on sex parties. It's just I think that I think that the, it was more for vanity uh, than anything. They they're. They love their, uh, the flair of life, but yeah, I could never, I mean, kudos if my parents could get down on some sex parties, kudos <laughs> to them, but I just do not see that in their personalities whatsoever, but 
Um, they had mirrors everywhere and uh, like to entertain for sex parties. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've like, got good holiday conversation fodder right here. Oh, my God. They, they would be like, never. We would never do that. Uh, but but <laughs> if I'm not personally knocking those uh, sex parties. They had mirrors everywhere. And so I would like get in front of the mirror. And I had a little show called The Rocky Show Begins. And I was like an Arsenio Hall talk show host. Awesome. Um, yeah, and then I started doing theater in eighth grade. My first play was Jack and the Giant, and I played Jack's sister, Susan. Um, and then after that, I was really kind of bitten by the acting bug. And yeah, I did all the plays or most of the plays in high school. And then my uh, theater teacher helped me because I didn't really know where I wanted to go for school. I just knew I I if I could, I wanted to stay. I'm from Connecticut originally, but I wanted to be in New York City or around New York City. And uh, I got into Adelphi, which is where Jonathan Larson, the creator of Rent, went. Hmm. And um, one of my acting teachers had also gone there. So, you know, the program still remembered him. He wrote me a great letter of recommendation. I had a great audition with them. And then I ended up going to Adelphi University in Garden City. Hmm. Were your mom and uh, dad pretty supportive of like I guess always. being a performer always. and all that stuff always unequivocally always. zero hesitation yep mm -hmm. always and still are that's killer yeah it's killer yeah I mean, very lucky there's not I mean I don't know at least in life in general I don't know about on the podcast but parents are always as far as liberal arts go they're always a little bit uh gun shy and so it just mm -hmm. did it always like I love hearing when somebody says yeah my parents were like 110 percent that's so cool They've never told me I can't do it. They've never told me you should have a backup plan. They've never told me any any kind of when people tell me that their parents say that say that to them, I really feel for them because I, you know, I get you know, just like I'll talk to my dad on the phone and he'll just straight up be like, oh, just wanted to remind you that I'm so proud of you. And I'm like, oh, my God, I sat on the couch. I should smoke a joint today and this man is proud of me. Like, <laughs> it feels really good. So when you hear things like that, you kind of want to continue to make them proud. Yeah. And so I try to do things, uh, try to do things that will make them proud. Yeah, man. Like I, I totally get that. Like somebody living their authentic self, mm -hmm. doing what makes them happy. It's like, how could you not be proud of that? Yeah. 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 I think more people, I think the world would be like a more kind and easier place to be if more people were just allowed to flourish in what made them happy, um, as long as it wasn't hurting anyone else. If yeah. they were watered and flourished to do the things that they enjoyed doing, more people would gravitate towards things they like doing and they would be better at what they were doing. If there's somebody who's like, man, I would love to spend all day cooking burgers, frying French fries, and putting it neatly in a little to-go bag uh, <laughs> at a drive-thru. If there was somebody who's like, I love doing that, and there was like payment that was livable, right. we'd have the best fast food places in the nation, you know what I mean? Or, or, or you could do that for any kind of career. Like any, if people just gravitated towards the things that, that made them happy and weren't stifled by a capitalist nation, Imagine where we could be. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know, man. Like I, uh, we have a lot of flaws here, but I mm -hmm. think of all the places you could be, this is the best one, right? So you take it's pretty take fun to go with the bad, right? And it's, I mean, the catch twenty two. Yeah. I love a Hollywood lifestyle too. I can't I can't say that I I'm not a victim of wanting the the finer things in a capitalist life. But when you're on the other side of it, you're like, oh man, this sucks. Oh, yeah. Dude, I <laughs> I remember being really super poor growing up and stuff like that. And uh -huh. and now I am um I wouldn't say I'm rich, but I'm not super poor anymore. And I could definitely appreciate both sides of it. Yeah, one feels better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one, one feels easier. One feels like a weight's lifted. My money has ebbed and flows through my twenties and early thirties. And what, I'll tell you what: when I have more money in the bank, it it might not take care of any internal happiness, but man, does it lift weights off your shoulders. Yeah. I think I think it was Johnny Cash that said, um, "Being rich means you worry about everything but money." Mm -hmm. And I've gotten to the part of my life where I don't worry how I'm going to pay my rent. Or, you know, like, am I going to be able to afford groceries? And to me, I feel rich now because, you yeah. know what I mean? It's like everything else is still there for sure. Um, I don't have that crazy money where I can live in like Prince World, you know, or like of course those not. uber celebrities where they're they're doing their crazy stuff. But um, yeah, yeah. I, you can I definitely, go comfortable. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it affords me the opportunity sometimes even to, to help other people, which I, we Good. were talking about it earlier. You need to start a Patreon because whenever I find somebody that's like an artist that's creating something that I truly enjoy, I want to support them because guess what? I want them to keep being able to do it. So, um, yeah. I have disposable income and I don't, I mean, I haven't had a life for what? since about March, 2020 now. So <laughs> I've got money that I would normally be like doing other things with that I definitely try and put towards my favorite creators. So uh, yeah, yes, that's a, another plug for you need to start a Patreon. It's going to take you <laughs> 10 minutes, bro. Just do I it. I know I need to, I need to do, I do need to look into it. I just feel like I, and I know you probably can relate as a podcaster, but I, it feels like I have a running to-do list of things that I need to do to keep up with this show when you're literally. Um... One thing I wanted to ask you was, it's like you said you knew you wanted to be in New York. Like, what was it that drove you from Connecticut to New York? Like, what what was the rationale? I was like, ah, this is where I need to be. I think it was uh, pretty drilled into us and I don't know if this is toxic or not but I think it was drilled <laughs> into us that that is you can either go to New York or you can go to LA if you want to be an actor and that's it that's it there's no in between uh so go to New York or go to LA that's kind of what I was told uh were the only two places I could go and because I wanted to still be around my family, still wanted to be around my friends. New York is extreme, was extremely close, not even an hour and a half away. So I, mm. I said, okay, I'll do it here. And then I had older friends who were in school in New York that I would go visit when I was in high school. And it was just fun, you know, spending Halloween with them, going riding the subway, going to see Broadway shows. So it was good. So that's how I ended up there here. <laughs> Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, do you feel that that is still true now that you've been there, you've been in the biz for a little bit? Do you feel like that, that you said toxic, so I don't know. I'm, I like, mean, toxic because in the sense that there are plenty of incredible acting programs across the country. There are probably some great acting programs in Connecticut. I didn't probably need to go to such an expensive, like private liberal arts school to get education to then, you know, be a waitress for 10 years after that while I, <laughs> while I, you know, grind it out to be an actress. Uh, maybe, I don't know, I wouldn't change it. I've made some of the best friends of my life who are like family to me now, but you know, sometimes you're like, damn, that was a really expensive education. So what do you pay for? I don't know, man. I think I think there's something to be said about going to the source, yeah. right? Like there's something magic about being in, in L.A. or New York. Yeah, right? I would agree. And to, and to answer your question, uh, do I still think it's true? I, I, I mean, no, but it's it's also different, right? You could be TikTok famous from your basement in Iowa now. You don't need to be, you know, living in a 10 by 10 foot apartment in New York to be famous anymore. So but that's evolution, right? And mm. is all all these TikTok celebrities, do they have staying power? Because I've heard from some people that go see TikTok people it, live. They're like, oh, they have no stage presence. They have no this. They, But their their area of expertise is TikTok. So I don't know. I think if you want to do what I want to do, which is continue to do comedy, live comedy in New York and uh, associate myself with other comedians in New York and interview people, then it might be best for me to stay planted in New York. But it's a hard question to answer with the evolution of technology, you know? Mm. You love being there? Like, yeah. I mean, aside from comedy and all that other stuff? Yeah, I do. I love it a lot. Um, you know, I'm not going to lie the subways have gotten a little grimmer. I used to be on the subway a lot for my current job. Um, I work, I work in theater currently, um, in children's theater, but it, I don't have to take the subway pretty much ever for work. I either drive or walk. And, uh, the few times that I've had to take the subway, yeah, they've gotten a little grimmer. I think, you know, the city's slacked in that department in taking care of hmm. our subways, making them feel um, safe or as safe as they used to. You know, I, I used to, I would go on the subway and I would just be on my phone scrolling or, or listening to music, not paying attention. And now when I'm on the subway, I'm very aware. I'll read a book or something, but I won't take my phone out. And uh, the cars are, can be particularly 
earlier during the day and in the evenings the subway cars can be pretty empty so at any moment somebody looking for trouble could like come on the subway so you know but then some news sources say their crime is completely down in the subway and that the news is is spreading information that it's not so they can increase police presence and then other statistics are like hey no the subways are really bad and then firsthand people who ride the subway often are like these are really bad so it's Hard to know what's real and what's not, but I do does it love feel, it. Does it feel really bad as a woman by herself? Yeah. Or do you think a guy would feel the same uh, level yeah. of insecurity? I don't think that guys feel the same level of insecurity, but I mean, my brother is a six foot two man and he's, you know, pretty broad and, and I guess on first sight, maybe to somebody passing him might be a little intimidating looking, but he um, he's like, yeah, the subways are no joke. And he has to ride it pretty much every day for work. So, um, but New York in particular, so hopefully that gets a little better and maybe that'll get a little better with um, like the warmer weather and, and COVID kind of, we hit our peak again, another peak in December and it's, the numbers are definitely going down here again. So hopefully mm. it continues in that trajectory. And then when it gets a little warmer, things are better. You figure in the winter, more people are, are taking shelter on the subway because it's colder. So hopefully that's a, yeah. Gotcha. Hopefully that that clears up soon because I don't always feel great riding it anymore. Hmm. Yeah, it's that's a juxtaposition that I was made aware of like I don't know like five years ago or something. Somebody was um, talking about you know going somewhere at a certain time of day, and I was like, "What are you talking about? Why would you be worried about yeah. that?" And it's just it like it never factored in my brain that like women have to do like all this complex math. Like if they're going to go someplace, it's like, well, am I going to be alone? What type of day is it going to be? You know, like where should I park my car? Like you guys have to do all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Like never even enters my dumb man brain or whatever. That's very lucky. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I mean, talk about privilege, like that I don't have to worry about my general safety on a regular basis. That's pretty uh, awesome. I think most women are used to it, but it doesn't make it easier. Like we're all used to it. But it doesn't necessarily mean it feels great to have to do a whole other, add a whole nother layer to thinking about going out. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. It's, well, I mean, interesting after a fashion. Like, it's not great, no, but, but it's, it, it, it's new to me. And like, I, I love new perspectives yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. I say that word too much. And I don't uh, explain why. What, like, what I, word? I think, I don't interesting. I say interesting. Well, stuff is interesting uh, and things are constantly <laughs> interesting too. I mean, if you're not learning something new every day, even if it's just a, a strange little factoid, then what are we doing, you know? All right. Well, something else I was worried about or not worried about, wondering mm -hmm. about, and this is like completely divergent, yeah. was like how do you um how do you do how do you deal how's it was it like for you when you look back at stuff? That you've done in the past like you look at your previous art is that a little cringy are you totally okay with it do you see it as like oh that was part of the process to get me where i am now um well i haven't listened to any of my early podcast episodes which i have been meaning to do because i want to just go through a log of old stories i've told and stuff particularly in openings and um rundown so i don't repeat anything I know yeah. that happens that, you know, I've listened to podcasts long enough where I'm like, oh, he told this story already. So I'm trying to avoid that. But again, with time, you're like, oh, there's not enough hours in the day. I don't, um, I've gotten cringe about old Instagram post captions, like, like <laughs> captioning an Instagram, like a picture with like a Nicki Minaj quote in like 2016 or something like that. That'll make me go like, ugh. But I always heard that if you're cringe at things that you've done in the past, uh, like if you're like, oh man, I can't believe I said that quote or I can't believe I did that, that usually is a good sign because it means you've grown as a person. You've grown. So I, yeah. I try to take that as like, okay, so I've, I've grown and I'm continuing to grow. Well, and I, what sparked that um, that uh, that comment or that question rather is that I was you know I was doing a little digging around and I found this thing called NYC Reviewed that you did 
So, oh, look at that look on your face. Uh, so long ago, you were like a baby yeah. in that. I was just curious, do you ever look back at that stuff and like NYC just reviewed, think about um, that? Well, so that was, wow, that is a deep cut. I um, Yeah, dude, uh, I, went, I went in the archives. That, yeah, that was a show that my ex-boyfriend and I did actually. Um, and he was, he, he happened to be on that improv team that I was telling you about, the one that was together for five years. It was his idea to start it and it it was his idea to start it from the restaurant char number four that had the pork nuggets. So the I know that <laughs> I heard you say the pork nuggets in that episode. So you see what a lasting mark these pork nuggets have made in my life. <laughs> from a video. It's something like cheese chunks or two, something like uh, that. Fry, I think fried cheese. It was fried cheese. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah he he's, he was a comedian too, and uh, we obviously lived together for a long time, and and so he had, uh, asked me to do the show with him, and so we would just like take twelve minutes, uh, fifteen minutes, and we would record us reviewing a place that we went to, and then he would edit it. And um, honestly, we started to gain a little bit of traction, and then he kind of was like not into the editing. I was doing like all the behind the scenes, like trying to build our audience, and he was uh, not. He stopped like editing our videos, so we stopped doing it. But people really liked NYC Reviewed. I, I think I have watched maybe last year. Uh, I think he came over and we watched a few of them. We like showed him to a friend of mine, and we had some laughs about it. But. Um, I don't find them cringe because I I'm like oh this was like cute and fun and we oh, were it was adorable yeah we were yeah. having fun doing it um but I do wonder if like where my life would be if uh he was it was his idea but if he had been more into it I think we could have actually because it was at a time where not everybody was doing something like that nowadays everybody's a critic everybody's reviewing something but in 2012 and 13 that wasn't as popular and I thought we had something good so I always do wonder what would have happened if we had a uh, put more effort into it as a, a duo but uh I, I that was fun nyc reviewed was fun yeah. yeah yeah you um it was just funny what i liked was the juxtaposition of watching the nyc review rocky versus uh the wild nights <laughs> podcast rocky i was like these these are two similar people but man there's some there's a pretty big gulf in between the oh two my god i'm interested what do you think the the gulf is Oh, you just seemed so young, fresh faced, naive, <laughs> innocent in those. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not saying you haven't been around the block even at that point. Uh, but uh, no, no, you just like it. So you just seemed, you seem like you've really settled into yourself and who you are now. Um, and maybe you were a little bit more edited and measured. Yeah. And like being like a, I don't yeah. know, a different persona. I'm not yeah, sure. That's funny, like, because. We don't we don't hang out, so I don't really know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> but but just just you know seeing those two little things that's so funny. Uh, it was interesting. And so it's just when I see people, um, you know, change over time, like you said, and then you look back. A lot of times the reaction is like cringe, like ah, oh, gosh, that was. I can't believe I said those things. That was so dumb. Yeah. Whatever. But I, I like that you can look back on it objectively and say this was young yeah. me and. It's like a moment yeah. frozen in time, a couple of years frozen in time. We did like 13 episodes or something. Yeah, there was a few. I didn't watch yeah, all yeah. of them, but I watched a few. I jumped yeah. around. There was, yeah, some that were a long time ago, man. Yeah. Was, you guys, I think uh, you have a Tumblr page that still exists. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> so I was scrolling Flag through. That. <laughs> yeah. Booyah. Oh, I'll put links in there to your uh, to your Tumblr page. Oh, God, for your, no, feel you. free not to. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well let's i mean this feels like a good segue yeah. we already sort of introduced it tell me about uh wild nights and how all that stuff came to fruition yeah, of course so like i said i i was an improviser at the pit and one of the great things about our shows was afterwards, everybody hanging out, everybody going to the front of the theater to smoke a joint and have some laughs, especially if it was like a great show and then have some drinks together and have laughs. And then if, you know, it was one of those nights where people didn't have anything to do the next day, we would go out partying and, you know, <laughs> go to a cigar bar or just uh, or just close the bar down. And, and it was so many fun nights with comedians and so many memorable nights and so many relationships formed with other comedians. And then um, myself, my own personal self, I um, 
like I mentioned, or you mentioned NYC Reviewed, I had been in a relationship for a very long time and became single uh, in my late 20s, early 30s. And so I never really experienced like, even though my friend group is wild and we do wild things together, I'd never experienced like a single Rocky as a wild person. And I had a good, <laughs> like, I had a good, like two years where I was just saying yes to all the fun. Um, and it was great. And I had some extremely wild nights. And so during the pandemic, I would say probably I had the idea to start a podcast, I would say in uh, maybe January 2019, February 2019. And I had floated the idea um, to my friend Rich, who's a comedian. I traveled with him to Ireland and he was my first guest ever about being kind of like my Robin and Quivers to my Howard Stern because <laughs> I felt like he would be a really good sidekick. So I started jotting down ideas for a podcast and then it never. I never followed through. I didn't know how to like even begin it. It might have even been um no, it was January 2019. And I and I just kind of always had it in the back of my mind I want to do a podcast. I want to do a podcast. So I started to like bum out towards the end of October 2020. You know, the numbers were starting to rise again. I was getting little tastes of free freedom because people would like test we would test and then we would like go away for the weekend and then it all started and I was going on some dates and then it all started to be like okay we're back in the house so I decided if I have to be in the house I'm on unemployment anyway I need to be creatively fulfilled what do I do so I started that's when I started um wild nights and I knew I wanted to talk to entertainers but I also knew I wanted to have my own portion of the show and I didn't know how much I wanted to have my own like portion where I do my intro and I do my uh, Rocky Brown I didn't know how long I wanted that to be or or, or if that would just be a five minute thing and I, and they got started to get longer and then um I also knew I wanted to to talk to comedians but I didn't want to make the entire episode so yeah I, I just you know started reaching out to some people I knew and then with the boldness of the internet and the power of the internet you're like oh, huh I don't just have to reach out to my comedy community here in New York I can reach out to people in LA I can reach out to people in Indiana I can reach out to people in Florida I can reach out to people everywhere because I can just with the click of an email or a DM there you go um so that's when I started to get ambitious with the guests that I asked and then the rest is kind of you know it just became I became passionate about doing the show and uh, I started getting really creative uh for myself writing and I I think I found kind of a rhythm with my openings and I and I it comes very easy to me now where in the past I would be like so nervous and now I just trust myself that oh every week I know I can deliver so I'm just gonna continue to do that and yeah so the the show itself uh, every week I do an intro the intro is either a topical song or a poem uh, if I don't do a jingle song or poem I tell a story from my own wild night life and uh then i do what's called the rocky rundown which is basically just a recap of my week and anything that's gone down in my week wild or not <laughs> then i have the guests come on the guests will tell their wild night story ahead of time i don't know the story the guest is going to tell i think only once or twice i've known the story because i've been friends with the guest and they've i've heard it just through our um shared experiences so every guest who's going to come on the, the story can be as rated G or as explicit as you feel comfortable sharing. My only requirement is that it's wild to you and that you enjoy retelling it. I don't want anyone coming on and telling a bummer story, you know, <laughs> where they're like, oh, this was the worst night of my life and I haven't spoken to my mom in 20 years. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I always tell them, as long as you enjoy retelling it and you can genuinely say it's wild to you, please tell that story. And then um, it's usually a person, I'd say nine times out of 10 or every single time is my goal, is someone in the entertainment industry. So we just talk about what they have coming up and what projects they're working on and anything they want to plug. And uh, similar to you and me, you know, a little bit about their history and comedy and where they're at. And uh, I try to keep it under 
45 minutes to an hour when I'm recording because I do all the editing. <laughs> so as you know, that can be yeah. pretty tedious. And so, yeah, that's that's where Wild Nights came from. Well, I got to tell you, there is a level of polish that I love on your podcast. Like it just it feels wow. smooth and natural. Um, and what is particularly aggravating is I went back and I listened to your very first episode and it was almost just as smooth and polished and you already had your vision. You already had your voice. You already hit your points on your very first freaking episode. And that like is so annoying because it took me, wow. it took me a while, like on both of my different podcasts, one is like very technical and one is this. And it took me a while to find my voice, to find where I was going and what, you know, and here's this punk ass kid coming out here right <laughs> out of the gate rocking it and it was just so annoying oh my god that is so, like you're literally gonna make me cry right now that is <laughs> the nicest the, what a what a genuinely kind and nice compliment thank you so yeah. much and wow. notice how i called you. you like an asshole when i said it too <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah no i i i speak your language don't, don't, you, worry. don't you worry no god, i mean it's so, so good like oh I'm, I'm gonna gush for a second here so um one, your intro song is a bop, dude. I love it. Like when it comes oh, on, you. you just like just crank it up a little bit. Although whenever I have it on like one X, like one point six speed, it sounds a little weird. But <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm gonna be honest. Sometimes I slow it down just oh. so I can hear the intro song, and then I'll speed it back up. I do that with armchair expert. <laughs> <laughs> I slow it down just for the intro. <laughs> but then, um, yeah, like I, I love that I never know. What's going to come at me in that interesting and the Rocky rundown, like I could legit just listen to a super cut of the Rocky rundowns. There is not a single one that I've listened to that I haven't had like multiple laugh out loud moments where Thank you. you just say some crazy stuff out of left field and it just <laughs> makes me laugh like every freaking time. It is the best, dude. Thank you. I dig it. Thank but you. I, I love, um, I don't know. It's like, uh, I don't think it's unique to me, but I love hearing the process. Like I love hearing what's in people's heads like i don't just want people to say i did this thing i want you to tell me i like the weird way that you figured out to and you do that you're <laughs> like you're telling me weird stuff and i love your stories about dating <laughs> <laughs> and uh like being on tinder and oh my gosh i've seen you in your underwear at this point uh one of your episodes <laughs> you talked about um how you were in 2017 you were on like the rachel ray show and so oh, yeah. I, I I went to Google. I went uh, 2017 Rachel Ray Bra Show. Oh, there it is. And uh, I thought it was <laughs> hilarious. It was like you were selling the fact that you really like this bra and you were like energetic and happy <laughs> about it. <laughs> like this is. But then I hear the background story about like what happened after. It's just that's like <laughs> so weird seeing all these strange worlds collide together. It is like, yeah, it is like such a strange trip listening to you and also i've noticed that every guest you talk to i assume is your best friend because you have like an instant rapport with people and like you're back and forth it is like instantly like copacetic friendly it's so trippy because i know you've told me that like you're reaching out to people that are virtual strangers and a lot of them dude, yeah. your rapport is like off the charts like i just like tell me a little bit about uh one like how you even like decided to do the Rocky rundown? How did you think, like, did you think, oh, people are going to be interested in me going to the corner store and picking stuff up? It's like, where did that come from? I think uh, I introduced the rundown. That might have been episode five or, or maybe the, I had the Rocky rundown the entire time, but the the intro song to the Rocky rundown, which my brother, uh, totally, that was his whole vision. And he created that, uh, for me and edited it and spent, uh, some time on that for me. So I'm really grateful because I love the little beat that he made oh, yeah, it's uh, and, the, and the splice, but that's all him. And, um, I think I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I like, uh, when things are broken up into segments and I wrote my first ever, I guess, episode three. I remember I did the Jackson 5 interpretation of three, the Little Drummer Boy, because I was listening to Little Drummer Boy and I'm like, yo, this song is so good by the Jackson 5, like their version. <laughs> but then I was like listening to the lyrics and that made me, my brain go like, you know, this whole 
this whole like story of them delivering gifts, a uh, little drummer board style, I thought it was so weird. <laughs> so I just kind of like wanted to give my interpretation of that. And then I got really brave to write the poem um, on episode five, which was, uh, would you, would I bang an alien? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I got stoned one night and I think I saw, I was scrolling through Instagram, Joe Rogan posted a thing. It's like aliens are coming in 72 days. And I was like, if aliens really came to earth, would we bang them? You know, people would. So, so <laughs> I think after that is when I noticed I needed to do a distinction. Like I was always going to do an opening and then I was going to like, get my little creative uh, feels out, whatever I needed to, my creative energy, keep that fresh. And then just talk about the rundown. And the rundown is like actually a pretty, uh, it's a it's a shortcut to the show because I'm going to always live my life and so I just take notes throughout the week of the things that happen and then I just um expand on them on paper do you think taking out. notes during the week like that's made you kind of more present in your life like thinking about what you're doing more and stuff like that yes and no ah. uh yes and no because sometimes uh it's great. Oh man, this would be so good. And then I'll remember everything. I'll look back at my phone and I'll remember everything. But just last night I was watching the most recent SNL. I was catching up on it and I had three thoughts throughout the whole episode. I'm like, Oh man, this would be good to talk about. This would be good to talk about. But my phone was in the other room charging. So I don't. <laughs> um, so while I'm watching the show, I'm like, Oh, I want to talk about this on the show. I want to talk about this on the show, but I forgot to write it down. And I um, can be, I have a really great memory for events and stuff that happens, but little thoughts that I know I need to, if I think, Oh, I need to jot this down. I'm not going to remember it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like I keep a notepad like in every room of the house just for that reason. Cause like something will pop into my head precisely dude. I'm over here with like this mess, but like, um, yeah, something will pop in and I know it's got I mean, it's like a shelf life. Like you pulled the pin on the grenade. There's yeah. you got about ten seconds before it falls out of my head. So I gotta, yeah. I gotta get it out. Especially like something like my... this where we're talking. Like mm -hmm. it is definitely because I want to be present. I want to listen, but yeah, it's fixing to fall out. So I gotta, I gotta scratch something down. It's hard. Yeah, it's wacky. Well, something else I really love is that uh, you have like a crew. Like all of your people that are listening, we're all in this together. We're part of your posse. Or the party god squad. I love yeah. that you like you need to put you need to trademark that. I love it that you have like a little name for your crew. Isn't that the the way though with podcast? A lot of podcasts have like uh, names of their listeners. So I um I'm like oh the party god squad. I just I've always liked parties. So um <laughs> and I feel like with wild nights it's it's god squad. You don't necessarily need to rage. You just need to be like down for a good time, whatever that means to you. I feel like it's open for. For anybody, you know what I mean? Whether you, you throw them back or your like idea of a party night is reading a book and like laughing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like, you know, it's like we're, we're all ready to yes and. We're just mm -hmm. ready to, to roll with it. I can dig it. So if we're the party god squad, what does that make you? Um, oh, man. You don't want to say guess... party god? You don't want to say it? Um, what, would I be the party god? I don't I know. So. Well. I guess I would just be Rocky. <laughs> okay. I guess I would just be Rocky. Oh, you don't want to you don't want to self declare uh, party <laughs> god. You don't want to call it. Well, I would be the party goddess. Um, oh. So, uh, but but I don't know. I I don't know if that's flowing off my tongue as easily. But I guess I would I would say be like Josie and the Pussycats, Rocky and the Party God Squad. <laughs> <laughs> So we're your backup dancers. I get it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can get down with that. But I think that's so cool because I don't know. It's stupid, but it makes me feel like, like, like I'm on board. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah like I'm in this with you now. So yeah, I, can totally I, feel, I feel that way too when I listen to podcasts and they like have a name for their, their listeners. I feel the same. I'm like, oh, we are in this together. Well, I can dig it, man. I'm on there. Yay. So what else? What else is like cool and interesting? I'm curious, like, have you been really surprised by any of these stories? Um, Anything shocked yeah, you? Some, some of them were were pretty wild and crazy. I um, had a 
a woman tell me a story about how she got arrested because she stole a cab. <laughs> um, that was the Veronica Garza episode. That one always, um, that one always kind of like, man, what a night. She's from Texas too, originally. And uh, when I have friends come and they tell me a story that I, I haven't heard before, I, I like that Asher Rogers is a friend of mine. And um, if you haven't checked out his his episode or his pilot, he has a really, really funny pilot on YouTube, a uh, pilot episode called Illegal Allen. It was great, great. I just wanted to make more episodes, but obviously stuff like that needs funding. But he told me a story where he, I think he got, lost in Mongolia he took a train to Mongolia and he was like the only white person who spoke English in Mongolia and like there was no one to help him I always thought that story was really great and the amount of times I've partied and hung out with Asher when would I have when would he have ever told me that story because we don't really hang out one-on-one -on -one. we always hang out in a group setting and then you know we're talking about what's going on in the party or mundane life stuff so yeah, I am. Um, I'm really tickled by a lot of the stories. I feel really happy when people share them uh, and they feel comfortable enough to share them. And I've had people tell me that they're, they're like, oh, you know, I'm nervous to I'm nervous to tell the story. Uh, I've never told the story. I've had a lot of people say, you know, I, I want to tell I was going through it with my friends last night. I've said it a couple times. And that makes me feel good because that means they care to mm. be there. So yeah, a lot of stuff's been surprising. I love the celebrity stories. I'll tell you a little fun fact. A lot of the times when people tell me a story about a celebrity encounter, they often will tell me more, and I'm not at liberty to repeat anything, but uh, <laughs> they will often tell me even juice details off screen. Like I, could, I, I couldn't share this on the podcast, but actually this happened too, or actually they acted this way. And that feels really cool. That feels like, oh man, I had this awesome person on the show. They were, they told me this really great story, and then I got a little insider um, after, a you know, little extra afterwards. And this season, I'm having um, returning guests. Obviously, it's season two, and I'm, I will space them out. It'll probably be a returning guest every fifth episode. Um, but the first one is going to be comedian Gwen Sunkel. So her episode will be out not this coming Monday, uh, the 31st, but the following, uh, February 7th. And she's my first returning guest. I have another returning guest. Uh, that'll be five weeks after that. And so, yeah, that, that feels cool, too. I've never met these people in person, and they're coming on my podcast for a second time. And they want to be there. That's cool. That's cool. Well, I mean, yeah. it's obvious. Like, you're so easy to talk to. Got a report. Something I was curious about is, like, <laughs> When you interview your friends, do you ever get a story that makes you look at them in a different light? Like, oh, uh, you're a little bit, uh, a little bit stranger than I thought. No, not stranger. I've never gotten a story because I probably for every like for every like fourth or fifth episode I do, it's probably a friend in the comedy community. Uh, all, all the rest are people I, I don't know or don't know as well, even if they're New Yorkers. I will say uh, my friend Megan O'Malley came on and she told a story about doing mushrooms at Bonnaroo. And this happens to be a friend that I have done mushrooms with uh, in the past. <laughs> and it just, it made me um, fall in love with her more as a friend because she was talking about the group she was with and how like, you know, it was something along the the lines of like people didn't watch her bag or something I just made a note to myself that anytime I'm ever out with my friend Megan O'Malley I will make sure that like even if she doesn't know it that I always whatever crowd we're in like I'll always have her back I'll always make her feel like me and you are leaving together and like she's a she's a comedy friend that I made many years ago but as we've gotten older she's become like a beach bud so every summer we go to the beach together a couple times like celebrate each other's birthdays together and she's somebody who's become gradually close and as the years get on we've we've become closer so yeah that made me look at her differently that in the sense that anytime we're out in public. I'm always going to make sure she knows like I'm watching you, Megan. I got your back. Gotcha. And, like you're not, you're not in this bar alone. She's your ride or die. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I dig it. I dig it. So something else I've noticed in your episodes, you are like extremely supportive of all your guests, which I, I like absolutely love, but also you seem to do a little like therapy every now and then 
in your episodes. Oh, yeah, really? You, I didn't notice yeah, that. <laughs> you, guys, you guys like suss some stuff out. I, I dig that. Like, I was curious if that was um, intentional or if it just sort of happened. I guess it just sort of happened because I didn't even notice that. Yeah, it seems like every now and then you guys work through some stuff. <laughs> and I like it. Oh, wow. That's that's a great observation. I I don't know. I just always try to like... It's so much... Have you ever been at a party, like a big party, where you know everybody there and every time you turn a corner, everyone's like, oh, Greg, great to see you, Greg, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, ah, oh, I got to go over and get something to drink. But then you go over to get something to drink and like more people are excited to see you. <laughs> uh, no, uh, Rocky, that's not how I live my life. Uh, people don't generally enjoy my company. Um, I'm enjoying We aren't company all right now. the party god. You know, I'm just You're saying. the party god squad, though. Um, <laughs> well, so that is how I like life to be. Yeah. I like everywhere you go, like somebody knows you or, or it's a familiar face. Like I try to live my life like that. So when I have guests on, if we are like working through a therapy, I don't know. I like to like break down that little wall. So then if I see them in person, I've run into, I think, maybe three guests in uh that i hadn't met in person that are new york comedians that i met since having them on the show and the greeting has been like huge hugs mm. i'm so happy to meet you in person this is great and it felt like all our w walls and guards were down and um i like to be a person that people feel safe talking to and then so when they do see me in public or if they turn their head at a party and they see me, they can be like, Rocky, great to see you. And I can be like, oh, so-and-so, great to see you too. And that just makes the whole like life in general better. Mm. If people are happy to see you or if people are like pleased when you walk in a room and if you treat people like you're happy to see them or you're pleased that they walk in a room, like it just makes this, nobody fucking knows why we're here, what we're doing here we're you know forced to do all these little things and make money and like eat and we have to take care of our bodies and there's like so much responsibility that comes along with being a person when none of us asked to be here unless you believe in that uh you chose your life there's people that believe they chose their life before they came on earth they like picked their person and they picked their parents um which is a totally valid thing to believe if people believe that um I tend to believe in reincarnation sometimes, but anyways, what, regardless of what you believe, we have to be here anyway, whether his beliefs are true, my beliefs are true, your beliefs are true. We got to be here. So let's just like make it a fun, fun time before, you know, the next shit storm. <laughs> yeah. They're always coming. They're always around the corner. Yeah. So well, I, I think I, I think I'm a kindred spirit and like, um, at least what I heard you say is basically if you believe in something and it doesn't hurt anybody else and it brings you peace and happiness, yeah. then man, I'm all for it. You know, yeah. like, totally. I totally dig on that. Like anything that helps you get through the day, man, Oof. I'm, I, you know, do it. I'm all for it. You're do not it. hurting yourself. Yeah. You're not hurting anybody else, man, go to town. But yeah, what I think I heard you say too, is that you like to, be that for somebody, even if just for a second, that little bit of light, that little bit of positivity. And you want to show people that you're happy to see them. Yeah. Yeah. And I can dig that. Like, I, I, I love that. Just the idea that because that's draining. I mean, it really is to like be that person that's always up. Be like if at that party scenario, every person you see, you have to be upbeat and happy and so positive. Seeing it like that takes energy. And the fact yeah. that you're willing to give that just because you know it's going to make that other person feel good. I think that's, I mean, Jesus, I wish everybody could have a little bit of that. Like, I know I need that. You know, I need somebody to, to be that little bit of light and positivity. So I think that's so cool. That you no, I'm no away. saint. I won't say like I'm not the, this like Mr. Rogers walking around <laughs> where it, like where it's I don't like be nice. That. But I, you know, I have people that I dislike, or through the years, you're like, oh, that person's gonna be there. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not walking around holier than thou. But I will say, for the most yeah. part, because you know, yeah. people are some people are assholes, and some yeah. people like do stuff to hurt your feelings and stuff. And, and not to say not everyone deserves to be forgiven, but and maybe everyone deserves to be forgiven, but everybody doesn't always deserve a seat at your table. 
uh, even though you can treat them with kindness or treat yeah. them, you can put, you can put people at a distance too. So, um, I'm not going to act like a, you know, the whole, my whole life. I'm always like, it's, it's love, peace and love, baby. That's come with like years of psychedelics and uh, <laughs> meditation. So <laughs> that's where that comes yeah. from. But, but for the most part, yes. Like I, I always have huge birthday parties and you'll see people at my birthday parties who I might not have talked to them for three or four years but they're like oh Rocky's having a party I know that she won't care. even if I missed uh, an invite if I missed uh, to invite someone and I haven't talked to them in two or three years they know oh Rocky's having a birthday party I'm welcome at that birthday party and it's true like if I was friends with you years ago and we haven't talked in two or three years and you hear I'm having a party and you show up I'm never going to be like uh, if we didn't have like a bad ending or anything which I don't really have bad endings with a lot of people so hmm. You know, people people know that a, a rocky party is a, a safe party for, for friends and plus ones. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, I never accused you of being an angel. So but no. you are <laughs> the party god. Party god, not an angel. So I get it. Party god is. Oh, party goddess. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's like saying actor or actress. And I just like yeah. everybody's an actor, right? Yeah, 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 that's true. So you could be the party god. You don't have to put an that's S That's true, on. that's true. Yeah. I just like the way goddess sounds. <laughs> party deity, whatever you want. Party deity. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a good one. All right, dude. Well, I want to be really respectful of your time. We're right there. Yeah, this has been so fun. Yeah, dude, you're a blast. You're a blast. So, a blast. Uh, again, is there anything you want to plug other than your amazing podcast um, the wild nights. I'll put links to all that stuff. Is there any other way that yeah. you want people to interact with you out on the internet? Well, before we go, I do want to say how cool it is that your last name is. Is it pronounced Sowell? I well, it's, yeah, it's supposed to be. So my mom got divorced, moved away, and then she started pronouncing it Sowell. So that's like for that uh, Sowell, but all the rest of my family says Sowell. So yeah, Sowell because my last name is Powell, and so I, I thought it was cool that our last names rhymed. But I wanted to make sure. Oh yeah, I was getting it. Booyah, booyah ka. Um, <laughs> yes, you, by, at Wild Nights with Rocky on Instagram and um, TikTok if you want to follow me there, on Twitter at Wild Nights Pod. If you want to follow me personally, I think the best way to do that would be um, on Instagram at Rocky with two eyes, R O C K I I X Balboa, um, or Rocky with two eyes Balboa on Twitter. Uh, I had my original Instagram was Rocky with two eyes Balboa, but then I it was like the early Instagram days, and I forgot to like I forgot my password and my login. So now Rocky Balboa exists, but it's Rocky X Balboa on Instagram. So that is if you want to follow me as a person, um, my profile is public, so you don't have to follow me if you want to be a lurker. But I always appreciate the follow and. Uh, yeah, that's that's where that's where I'll post if I'm doing any shows or my latest podcast episode, and um, most importantly, listen to the podcast. And if you like it, share it with a friend and uh, try to make them laugh. Yeah, and for sure, I would say everybody at her DM her, tell her to get her Patreon going. Just <laughs> bug her until I will be I will be patron number one. So. Put the thing up. I, w- I want to pick your brain off screen just for a second about Patreon a bit because I don't really talk to anybody who I know people have them, but I've never talked to anybody. But so I would like to ask you a couple questions yeah. off screen. But uh, that's how people can follow me. And um, I really thank you for everything nice that you said. I remember in your original email that you were like, I found you randomly. Yeah. So that was um, huge, a huge compliment to me. And I don't want to get like, emotional but that was like re- really nice and i appreciate everything you said about the show and and listening and stuff so thank you yeah for sure dude like here here in the the outro i just like to say a little uh, whatever pops into my head yeah. and, and i really um i found you randomly i think i don't know man i think it was like one of the little uh like little video blurbs you know, or yeah. the little, I don't know, it was like 10 seconds or 15 seconds with one of you. Like a podcast, like hashtag podcast recommendations or probably, something. Probably, that's probably yeah. where I found you. Anyway, I just, the screenshot, I was like, I need to see what this is. That's not what I was looking for, but I clicked on it anyway. And you, I don't know, just instant rapport, hilarious. I'm so, I don't know. Sometimes there's just like a kindred spirit that just pulls me in. So I was always like the shy, socially awkward, anxious kid. And I always was attracted to the loud, crazy people. 
And so they are still my, they are still <laughs> my people. And so I don't know. I just, it's like, I can live vicariously through you. I've sort of moved that direction a little bit more here later in life, but I'm still not that person. So yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for your time. Like strangers contacting you out of the blue. It's always odd to me when people say yes. Um, so I really appreciate it. But yeah, dude, just like your energy, the positivity you put out, uh, really your work ethic, because I know how much goes into this. And bro, you've been like killing it. It was like 50 episodes in a row putting that stuff out. So that doesn't come easy. That takes blood, sweat and tears. So a lot of respect as far as that goes. Thank you. But just the idea that I don't think I've ever heard you say one negative or disparaging thing. It's always uplifting, always funny. Um, and you got a great energy. And so, uh, I really appreciate yeah, that, dude. It's like, uh, especially now more than ever. Like I need, I need to be surrounded by folks like you. We all do. So, uh, you're not unnoticed. You're not unseen. I think it's, it's awesome. So thank you again. This is where I'm going to cut it. I'm going to click stop on the thing real quick.